Policy Nerd, it's good to have you. January 6th, we hope, represented a nadir in the timeline of American democracy, hopefully a low point. Maybe a springboard or maybe a sign of the need for even further vigilance or worse things to come. Maybe a failed domestic terrorist coup serves a reminder that you can't take democracy for granted. The show, of course, strives to be a deep dive into why democracy has to be explored, maybe celebrated, maybe protected, and yeah, how to overcome and resist threats that are posed to it. It's easy to overlook, though, the real-time impact that politics can have. We try to do mostly evergreen stuff, topics that will still be important for us to understand about the evolution, change, decline, shifting, needs of, elements of democracy. We also want to not be blind to what is happening right now and real time. To talk about recent events and the impacts on American democracy, we're joined now by Tierney Sneed, like a tear on your knee, investigative reporter from Talking <laughs> Points Memo, recent creator of The Franchise. It's not about sports. It's a new newsletter devoted to democracy and voting rights issues. Tierney, welcome to Roxy Hi. Nerd. It's good to have you. So great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. All right. First of all, let's get the plug done. Tell us about Franchise. Tell us about how you first got engaged in a movie about uh, about professional football. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. That's exactly my interest here. Now, um, don't know a lot about sports, but I do know a lot about voting rights, at least in terms of the coverage that I'm doing for TPM. And I've been doing it for several years now. So it's been kind of an evolution towards what is now a fully formed newsletter product that people can get in their inbox. It comes every Monday. It's a recap. You know, it's part recap of just all the stuff that's happening on the state level, new laws, new lawsuits, et cetera. But also I try to put in some analysis in there, what I'm kind of seeing big picture, maybe some, you know, reporting or some scoops that I haven't been able to put in different in other stories and really just, you know, give you sort of a one-stop shop to know what is going on. So uh, we're really excited about it. I hope everyone can sign up and really want to hear your feedback. If you, if you think there's something that should be included, reach out to me. Uh, but I, I'm really happy about this product and that we're doing it. The answer to this question might be obvious, or at least I'll say, if asked this question, I would have an answer, but it might not be the right answer. It certainly would not be the complete answer. Yeah. What was the triggering point to start this newsletter, to move from sort of generalized reporting or posting on stuff uh, relative to politics and democracy versus, or as distinct from, a dedicated newsletter on the topic? What made you do it? Uh, it was it was sort of an evolution. We have a couple different you know, TPM, we're a small shop. We don't have super delineated beats, but we have a couple narratives that we follow closely. So there's a couple different things that have evolved over the years. You know, for a time, there was sort of standalone sort of newslettery products about Trump corruption and this and that. And so there is a, uh, for before we had the full newsletter, there was just a weekly post that I would do that was on the website, um, just kind of updating things. Again, you know, as a way to surface stories that I haven't had time to do like full standalone post on, but want to get on people's radars. And, you know, recently we were able to, the great people in our tech department were able to, you know, pull together this, this product that can be delivered into an inbox to post it just on the website. So it's sort of a long time in the making. It's been a couple of years that I've been, you know, kind of summarizing the news that voting rights news in one way, shape or form, but the, uh, Having it be a newsletter is really fun and I think has really helped with the readership and, you know, getting it right in front and center with people who might not be, you know, checking our website every week. So I'm very excited about it. And this may offer two incorrect or insufficient pigeonholes. What is the ratio of good news to bad news in the newsletter reporting on democracy? Oh, I would say it's mostly bad news, Damn but it. I'm trying to be <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, Every couple of weeks, I try to sort of check in with the sort of the the good things that are happening in states. And, you know, maybe it's not every week that I'm putting those updates, but I want to keep them on people's radar because, you know, it, I, it, I want to go to show that the activism, the outreach to local lawmakers, all of that stuff can work and is working in a lot of states that are taking really positive steps towards ballot access. So I, I definitely don't want to ignore those 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 efforts and want to highlight them when I can. But unfortunately, there's a lot of bad news that's out there. And, and the thing about the bad news is it happens really quickly. You know, some of these bills are introduced and within a few days are 
you know, passed out of legislatures. Yeah. So you kind of have to act fast to keep keep an eye on them. Which is why we appreciate your time and even resembles the conversation in preparation for this. Like, listen, if we're only covering evergreen topics and we're not also making sure that democracy addicts or democracy optimists or even just democracy watchers are paying attention to what's happening day to day, you know, the evergreen topic of, hey, what's H.R. 1? All of a sudden, well, wait a minute, maybe H.R. 1 is no longer a topic or it needs to be, again, even in, with more vigor. I've got to ask, the uh, the actions, the events of January 6th, uh, how much did they inform the work? Were you already working on this project prior to? Were you already planning the newsletter prior to that? Or did that help spur the effort? You know, I think it would have come come along without January 6th because I think sort of the story of restrictive ballot access, you know, curbing measures was kind of building up before that, certainly. And, you know, even before President Trump went on his sort of election reversal crusade, this had been a trend, at least since the Shelby County decision, if not earlier, that let states take certain states take more aggressive actions to curb ballot access. So it was sort of already building up. And then you have the full, you know, nine month arc or, or so of Trump from April and May starting to really kind of beat the voter fraud drum to January 6th. But what I'll say is what I'm covering in this now because of January 6th is a bit different than what I think I would have expected to be covering prior. I, I would have expected it to be more the traditional, you know, here are the bills, here are the lawsuits, here's what's happening on the national level to address this. But there's this whole nother layer that of stuff that I is new to me, even though I've covered voting rights more generally. And that's the sort of the, the post-election audits, the sort of insurrection violence, the threats, there's this kind of added layer of things that are currently perverting our democracy that are are new and not just, you know, ID laws or cutbacks to early voting. And that has been, you know, very much, I feel like, elevated and amplified by January 6th. What has been most surprising to you since you started this exercise? Maybe nothing now, right? It might be you've been watching this enough that you're your surprise calluses are worn thick, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, what anything that's kind of opened your eyes big? I mean, I guess what's been new and different to me is uh, the sort of shamelessness to it. And, you know, I think we might talk about this later, but I think the perfect example is this Texas legislation that was at least temporarily thwarted by um, Democrats in the state. But you know, this willingness to, you know, push push this really aggressive stuff, you know, letting it, making it easier for judges, making it easier for judges to reverse election results and and whatnot. And then when you get called out on it, pretend like it was a typo or wasn't supposed to be there. I mean, it really is just, you know, they just think that people just, it seems like some of these lawmakers think that they think if they move things quickly enough or in the middle of the night, people won't notice how aggressive these these proposals are. And that's been really surprising to me. You know, there used to be a time where it felt like there was at least a, an attempt to create some sort of ostensible rationale for why these new requirements and hurdles so that the ballot box were needed. And it seems like they're not even bothering now. I do want to get to some of the good news and even mm -hmm. maybe to start with that, because this could end up being a series of conversations about impending doom. And we'd rather yeah. not merely be that. There are is work being done in state legislatures around expansion of voting rights? So often we discuss, you know, topics like wealth inequality and all the uh, all the attacks on democracy. You've reported there have been some state election bills, including pro voting measures. What do you want to shout out? Uh, there's a lot of stuff to shout out. I think in the most recent newsletter, I, I highlighted some uh, some bills in Nevada that are expanding mail voting, uh, some steps Connecticut is taking to expand mail voting, uh, Illinois also expanding mail voting in different ways. And then you also have states like Kentucky that I think have, have um, created a really interesting contrast to what we're seeing elsewhere that that was it was a couple months ago, but it was a completely bipartisan Democratic governor, Republican secretary of state, complete overhaul that, you know, kind of enshrine some of the expansions that were temporarily put in place by the pandemic. And, you know, it wasn't a perfect bill. I think voter advocates would have complained by, about some of the provisions, but it was overall an improvement to the situation there. And it was one that was done bipartisan. 
which I think is really important to have, have examples to show where Republicans are willing to come to the table and talk about making voting easier in some ways and not just cut off access. And I think it's worth highlighting when, when you do see examples of that. I mean, it's only been what, for my paying attention, 10 years that the, since the Republican Party started being explicitly a party that was working in different states to do it, to using your terms, you know, limit voting access, right? So it's not, which was not the case with Republican secretaries of state in Oregon, Washington, many other states for decades where they're working and in, in certainly in the civil rights era, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. You can comment on that or push back on that uh, timeline or characterization, either push it forward or push it back. Uh, I am, though, interested in the dynamic that you're seeing in those states that are finding bipartisan success in pro-democracy measures, how that's playing out. Is it just because, well, there's some Republicans who want to make friends with the party in power, or is it actually finding some shared value around the exercise of democracy itself? I mean, I, I think one element to it that is worth noting is it seems like it's easier in places where Trump did not lose the election and spend six months or, you know, we're now six months now, I guess, uh, claiming that it was yeah. fraud, you know, and states where that were that weren't in that sort of spotlight, we are seeing, um, you know, at least in some places, a willingness to say, okay, what worked about this pandemic election? What, what did we like that we let voters do because of COVID that we can enshrine? But the problem is, is any state that, you know, was in Trump's crosshairs, that's just untenable because the, the voters there have been convinced that the election was stolen from them. And th this, that's where we're at with a lot of states that are just moving forward with any sort of bipartisan negotiation and whatnot. And I should say, you know, there's also plenty of examples of states that Trump won and they ran really good elections. But because of that rhetoric, they're still cut access. I mean, Florida is the perfect example. Right after the election, top Republicans were bragging about how great their system was and Trump even praised it um, in the, in the run up. And then because of months and months after of there still being this fraud talk, they, I guess, felt the need to still cut off some avenues of mail voting, which has been traditionally a very Republican friendly way to vote. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to me, which states have been able to sort of resist getting sucked into that, you know, voter fraud, alarmism, restrict the vote versus what states are getting sucked into it. But it, it's definitely not uniform across the board and worth keeping an eye sort of state by state how things are unfolding. What's the most credible source? And feel free to attack the premise of the question. What is mm -hmm. the most credible source cited to call into question the 2020 election? I don't think there's a credible source. Yeah. It seems like, you know, the I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill, uh, I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking to Congre Congre members of Congress and the Republicans who are, you know, not on the extreme of just spewing just like outright nonsense and want to have some sort of serious take on this. What you'll hear, and this is like the Josh Hollies of the world, is that the problem with the 2020 election was that you had several examples of various states where the rules were changed, not because a legislature came in and changed the rules, but because there was a, a consent decree or a judge stepped in to do it or a secretary of state stepped in to do it without the legislature's okay. And there's this theory that they like to push that somehow that's unconstitutional. And it's a very sort of rigid textual sort of overreaching read of the constitution they're putting forward here. And that's where they say, well, the 2020 election was problematic because it was conducted under some rules that weren't legitimate rules because they weren't passed by all these state legislatures. The problem with that argument is that the Supreme Court had a chance. There were cases in front of the Supreme Court before the election where they could have validated that argument and stepped in and say, hey, you we needed to stick to what the legislatures say with all these election rules. And they didn't. I mean, they certainly stepped in in other, other circumstances. They certainly stepped in when it was federal judges that were changing election rules. But there were other examples where you had different state officials changing the rules that they said at least five of them would said that's fine. So it's it's the most. I feel like it's like I said, it's the argument that r people who want to be serious and not seem like they're just totally off the deep end want to make, but it's not a particularly convincing one to me. There is a narrative 
it's been a narrative ever since I think Trump started running for office. Maybe before, maybe since the rise of the of the Tea Bag, later named Tea Party uh, effort. The uh, which is that there's the which is there is a populist is a term that many use resistance to elite power structures. And Trump was the manifestation of the and 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 if you read, which I do not recommend, sort of QAnon chat boards, the savior of this uh, sort of anti-elite, uh, pro-populist, pro-person uh, effort. It seems to me, and and that continues. All uh, that narrative continues even in the uh, even in the most of mainstream editorial boards when they say, well, essentially making it, well, Trump's a weirdo, but he doesn't represent, mm-hmm. it's like, or is Trump taking over the Republican Party or is he different from it? I mean, sort of making the, the interesting thing about Donald Trump being the way that he is very, very different from other uh, Republican elected officials. What I find interesting is not what makes him different, makes him the same. And when I look at, uh, when I look at voting rights, what's interesting to me is that any effort Donald Trump says that, uh, makes to call into question the validity of voting and elections seems really beneficial to those who would like an anti-majoritarian uh, system of decision making, right? If, if what you wanted, I mean, if you were George Will, right, of the manor born, and what you wanted to do was make sure that democracy didn't get in the way of actions by economic elites, well, then you'd want to limit the franchise to people who would tilt in favor of those elites. What am I getting wrong there? Or how could you make sense of what I just said if I'm not way off base? I think that the way I always look at it is that that Trump has a tendency to say the quiet part loud. And uh, what we... uh, what we'll see with him is that, you know, he takes these arguments that the Republicans put out subtly and says them in a really aggressive way that really kind of brings attention to how specious they are. And like the, you know, the fraud example is perfect because they used to, the way they used to talk about it was always alarmist, but it, it wasn't so over the top that you could laugh at it. But then you have the president coming out and saying, well, if I lose the election, it's rigged. And it sort of gives up like what's going on here. It's that you want people to not believe you lost if you lost. So you make up, you know, these fraud theories. And so in some sense, I I think it's sort of, um, he has just helped draw the contrast in a way that's more striking than they have been. And it's sort of cut both ways that it's certainly made on one end people willing to go to greater extremes to sort of um, continue on that sort of mission that he's sort of playing into and laying out. On the other hand, I think it's also kind of spurring this pushback. Sorry, I got a call. Uh, it's spurring this Sorry, pushback is, is, that would I they think- be interesting is, to include in the conversation? Should we conference them? <laughs> no, no, it was okay. spam, but it came in on my phone, so I got distracted. Okay. Uh, they spurred the, uh, his the way he sort of amplified this debate has spurred a pushback that I think is really fascinating and also worth highlighting. I think the perfect example is the way that he attacked the postal system uh, over the summer and fall. You know, I think even before that, people, voting experts and election experts were really worried about this expansion of mail voting, not because of fraud, but because the postal system can be a little cumbersome. It could be run a little late. The deadlines weren't really matched up for it. And so there is a sort of concern of, you know, if everyone's going to be getting vote by mail, you know, maybe we're going to lose some ballots just because it's just a different system. But then you have Trump sort of kind of screaming that he's going to, you know, defund the postal service. And that really put everyone on alert that, hey, we need to learn the rules. If I want to vote, I need to put it in a drop box. So I think what he's done has, like I said, it's just cr- created much stronger contrast in a way that things were kind of more muddled and gray beforehand. Does that is that making it harder to build bipartisan coalitions for pro voting efforts in just about every state? You mentioned Nevada, Connecticut, and Illinois. I think uh, is that are there folks who are now scared of their primary elections if they support something that used to be viewed as very much a bipartisan idea, which is it should be a little easier to vote? Oh, absolutely. I think it's absolutely a huge element to this. And I think, like I said, you know, you really have to look state by state, but there are places where, and, you know, you mentioned Oregon and Washington, where 
everyone liked vote by mail because a lot of different kinds of voters took advantage of it. You had rural voters and older voters who used it. And so those are Republican friendly voters. But then once Trump decides that he's going to, you know, criticize it, then you can't be for it anymore. And it's exactly the case that there's a lot of state lawmakers out there who know better, but feel like they will get primaried if they don't have some sort of restrictive, we're going to fight the fraud election proposal that they can tout. And that's why we're seeing this surge. Yeah, no, the the arch conservative uh, <laughs> candidates for governor, et cetera, uh, former Republican secretary of state of Oregon, et cetera, have all been firmly in favor of of vote by mail. And one of the arguments against it had come from uh, liberal activists who were, well, it's not as good for apartment dwellers and people who change addresses a bunch. And it mm-hmm. is good for homeowners who are there a lot. And that might not support, you know, policies that support poorer people. Uh, and now that's sort of been, wa- as I wouldn't say washed away, but at least what I just said isn't as complicated. Loud. It's become complicated. Yeah. It's become complicated. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask on the anything else on the state based front, anything else on states that we should be looking at, for examples. I would say, you know, I wrote a story about this earlier this week. I would tell everyone to keep an eye on Michigan because it actually brings together a couple different strains of democracy uh, threats. It's the state legislature, Republican controlled. They've benefited from a very heavily gerrymandered map. So, you know, they haven't necessarily earned the Republican control that they have of the, of the legislature and be, and they want to pass voter restrictions. But of course they have a democratic governor who will be vetoing them. So what they want to do instead is to take advantage of the ballot initiative process, but not put these restrictions in front of voters on a ballot to approve, but rather just get the signatures and use this back end way of letting the legislature adopt these restrictions. If they have a mere Three hundred and forty thousand dollars, three hundred and forty thousand signature signatures, which is a very small portion of the electorate. And if their plan comes together, they will be able to o- overhaul the election code without this the governor's, you know, having a chance to veto it. And it's very troubling that you know, it's I think a chief example of sort of minority rule further entrenching their power because you know a, a heavily gerrymandered legislature will be able to enact. Uh, election changes and it doesn't matter that the governor who is elected by a majority of the populace or even that the majority of the populace you know if given the chance to weigh in would probably weigh in against it doesn't matter they can still do it because of these sort of weird systems our system our system of government has put us in can we talk can we go back to first principles for a moment i i think of my own family uh, i was actually so i've been doing some work outside in the yard and working with a couple of people who are been helping outside in the yard. And it makes me think of my days, brief though they were, as a cattle hand, right, where I would work a lot, you know, getting very dirty, very hot, very sweaty and, and very sore, like making the world safer for eating steak and burgers. And the uh, and I think about the people I worked alongside. I think about my extended family that lives in Utah and Wyoming and other and other states that vote profoundly with profound margins for Donald Trump. And I don't want that to the former president to dominate this discussion. But I do think about how we build a consensus or at least a supermajority in support of a set of shared principles of democracy. So it is not merely a tug and pull between different voting rules that one party likes or one party hates, and that ends up controlling the entire zeitgeist, the whole the whole sort of mental superstructure of how the country can think about how democracy should work. And without mm-hmm. revisiting, do we want democracy in the first place? Why is it good for my family in Wyoming? Why is it good for uh, for the my you know, co-workers in Hermiston, Oregon, uh, to have a system where it's easier to vote or where even setting aside easier to vote, where democracy itself is the way it works rather than authoritarian regime. Heck, you know, Russia, China, India, they're moving in that direction. And uh, some people seem to be rooting for them. Yeah, and I think it's worth, you know, when we talk about these election rules, it, it often gets kind of centered around, you know, what are the battleground states? What are the states that will determine the White House or control of Congress? And I think it's really important to kind of see them on a really 
micro local level, because that's where these things really matter at the margins, whether it's your school board, whether it's your local commission. And, you know, that's not necessarily a partisan decision. That's just, you know, you want to choose the person, you know, your neighbor maybe to to represent you. But if the rules aren't fair, you can't do that. So I, I, I do think it's it's bad that it's becoming so partisan that you can't see it without kind of looking at it as one party, you know, getting an advantage over the other. But I hope that if people can kind of step back away from sort of the national dialogue and really think through what this means for their local elections, for, you know, the people that they know who are making decisions that affect their lives in a really direct way, it can help reframe the conversation a bit. It helps me if I, if I try to strip away political parties as, as wrong headed or impossible as that might be. But if I try to strip that away and then think about it, sometimes it helps. If instead I think about what we'd like to see happen, right? If what we'd like to see happen is a robust middle class, right? What are the systems of decision-making that would either help or hinder us from getting to a strong middle class? If we want uh, safe communities that people enjoy living in that don't either give you cancer and in which you don't get robbed, uh, where, and you know, where also you don't get asthma, what, what are the systems of decision-making that would make us live in communities that made people happier? If people wanted to have a chance at job, getting a decent job and not having somebody else lord over them uh, because they have a little job. And nonetheless, even though we fought a revolution, what we have is a bunch of unelected oligarchic kings uh, that just by function of the last 50 years of the American economy, why would it be good for them? Is there anybody now? What's what's almost shocking to me is how we know. When I think about it, it's shocking. But when I don't, it just kind of bums me out. If I don't think about it at all, well, I can just watch TV and be happy like anybody else or, or just only have a mild malaise. But is there anybody who's really good at, these days at talking about first principles, at making the case that democracy matters, this is something we should care about, that this is something we should work together on, and it isn't merely a manifestation of power of a particular party, a particular news network, a particular interest group, but in fact, this is an enterprise that we're in on together to try to make the world a little bit better rather than a lot worse. You know, one point that was made to me by a, a voting rights attorney who now works for the White House, he made the point to me once that, you know, we you kind of talk, like you said, you talk about it in like terminology of power. And a good way to think about it is kind of how voting helps people feel on a personal level. Mm. It really is about feeling like you belong to your community, that you deserve a say. And, you know, this comes a lot when you comes up a lot when you talk about ex-felons and the question of whether they should be allowed to vote, you know. And really for them, it feels like I've, you know, done my sentence, paid my dues. Do I get to fully reenter my society again, having sort of made amends for my crime? So I do think it's it's worth kind of seeing voting in that lens as well is, you know, it makes you feel like you're a part of your community if you get to have a chance to have a say in what that community looks like. So as we think about candidates or news organizations think not only about what voting or think less about, talk less about the impact that voting systems have on the power structure and more about the impact that is being had by the individual person who's given power by the franchise. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's insightful. That's helpful. Joe Manchin, hard pivot. <laughs> Very hard pivot. <laughs> Okay, well, he's certainly keeping uh, keeping us all on our toes here in Washington. Actually, just a, a couple hours ago, uh, it was made public his proposals for you know what he likes and doesn't like in, in S one, and we will see how that sort of shakes up what the plans are at this point for that bill. You know, most recently, Democratic leadership had said that they would be voting on S one next week, but. It remains to be seen if they're still going to try to change it. You know, I think they would certainly prefer to have a vote where it was 50 Democrats instead of 49 Democrats. But at the same time, I don't know if they're really, really willing to, you know, kind of scrap the plan right now for this, you know, proposal document that just got dropped a couple hours ago. But it it is fascinating to me because I, you know, to be honest with you, I, from the moment that the, the, the push started for this bill this year, I just never saw it as plausible as becoming law because I never thought there was going to be 50 votes to change the filibuster. And I never thought there was going to be um, 10 votes, 10 Republican votes for a bill like this. But I do think we're going to see a lot more sort of push and pull this summer than I would have expected. I don't necessarily think that it's going to become law, but I think the process of kind of letting every side 
make its point and kind of maybe, you know, going through the motions for Senator Manchin to let him sort of try bipartisanship and see where it gets him, I think is going to be really fascinating. And, you know, I do think there might still be a, a, a tight path for it to work. I still don't think it's likely, but I definitely think it's going to be a busy summer with him um, to see how this all shakes out. So you think there is at least a sliver of a chance for some democracy reform legislation to come out of this Congress, either because Manchin gets there or because there are a few Republicans who help him get there? So I think, like I said, I I just do not see 10 Republican votes for anything pro-voter. But I do think it's plausible, maybe not likely, but I think it's plausible that you can maybe find five Republican votes. And then the question is, can you convince Joe Manchin can we lower the threshold on the filibuster to 55 or make some of the other reforms that would require, you know, the minority to take on more of a burden and whatnot if they're going to filibuster a bill. And that's that's sort of the path I see right now. And, I, you know, I should say I think it's the same for the Voting Rights Act restoration bill. You know, initially, Senator Manchin said, let's focus on that because at least that has, you know, one Republican senator who's, you know, at least in the abstract supportive. But I think the path is the same there. I don't think there's 10 Republican votes, but I think there might be five Republican votes. And the question is whether there'll be enough of an opportunity for them to go through the motions of sort of showing that to Senator Manchin and whether that'll be enough to convince him. And frankly, several other Democrats, it's not just Senator Manchin, there's several other Democrats who are, you know, in favor of certainly the voting rights bill, but are nervous, if not outright opposed to gutting the filibuster in favor of passing it. So it's it's a complicated issue. And there's a lot of moving parts. I think Joe Manchin is certainly the punching bag, but I, I think it's a, it's a, it flattens the narrative a little bit to just assume it's just about him and his whims. I think there are a lot of moving parts here. So I, I do think there's a path to some form. Maybe it's the John Lewis bill with a few things from S1 tacked on, but I still think it's a really uphill battle and it will kind of have to depend on whether all the parts feel like they have their their sort of opportunity to try the thing they want to try to get it passed. On the policy, is there is there anything that a really moderate Democrat or a moderate Republican would object to a lot or maybe put the question differently? What would they object to most? So so if you say if you say Democrats have a bill on voting, yeah. It is now the case that I just punched people. Well, that's got to be bad. It's got to be bad. If there's de- yeah. and where, where for those of us who are democracy advocates, we were absolutely thrilled when there were some Democrats who said we're going to be for this voting crap because yeah. for a while it felt like an orphan that nobody was yeah. prioritizing it sufficiently. And now it's not an orphan, which is great. The bad news is and that means the Republicans will too many Republicans will now say, well, it must be bad. Are there are you hearing pushback? on particular elements. Obviously, lobbyists won't want lobby disclosure, right? Obviously, people who uh, dominate elections with huge checks won't want their checks to be limited. So I understand like pockets of power, but in terms of Republican voters uh, and that you might hear from them or you might hear from elected officials, are there elements of this stuff that are particularly controversial and hard for, let's say, some of Manchin's constituents just to continue that straw person? I think the thing with S1, it's a really big bill and it's got a lot to do it. And I'll be the first to admit I've been most focused on the ballot access elements to it because that's the thing I've kind of covered the closest. I, you know, here and there I cover campaign finance, but I would never call myself an expert. Likewise, the ethics reforms are, you know, something I mentioned, but not something I'm deeply invested in the way I am on the ballot access stuff. And I think if you start pull, pulling apart the pieces of that, you would find sort of different coalitions of opposition and support. Like I certainly think you would find examples of this sort of populist strain in the GOP party that would actually be like pretty into campaign finance reform. And I think you hear time and time again, that's actually a really popular part of the bill when you pull voters themselves and not just, you know, rely on politicians. And that's why there's been such a desire to keep it all together because I think people kind of see, you know, popular elements in all these little pieces, but it is certainly making it very complicated for the vote counting, particularly when you're trying to pick off Republicans. So I think what was really notable to me and Manchin's uh, proposal that was unveiled today was his putting partisan gerrymandering, you know, banning that or limiting that as one of the things that he supported, because I think that would be incredibly consequential. It would really change the entire dynamic in Washington in a way that as important as things like early voting and mail voting are, you know, they're kind of incremental and things on the edges and they're important, like kids are close, they're important, but if, if we got rid of partisan gerrymandering, Enormous. it would completely 
it would completely change the political dynamic. If you had to fight for every last voter and it, you were fighting to the center as opposed to the extremes, it would completely change the incentives for legislating, for governing, for crafting deals, for doing things because they were popular among the general populace as opposed to just your sliver of primary voters. And so, you know, if it was if it was me, if I was in the, in the legislature, I would see that and say, let's let's see what, where we can go there, because that's a consequential thing. And like, you know, maybe if we can't get Joe Manchin on some of this other stuff, it's a bummer. It stinks for, you know, voter advocates who really believe in this. But it's still that be a big would deal. be huge. Yep. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know if there's 10 Republican votes for that or five Republican votes or one Republican vote. But like. You know, if you kind of see him as the, the centrist weather vane, I thought it was really fascinating that was on his list. And, and we've dug in a little bit to that. And the, the strongest counter argument on a state by state effort is that it ends up if you do uh, if you change gerrymandering, gerrymandering state by state, it em- ends up having maybe a, an unequal impact on the on the sort of national conversation. There are either, even pro-democracy advocates who have been nervous about doing a patchwork where they might like innovation in any number of ways, uh, might not like preemption in any number of ways. This is a place where they've been a little nervous because if if you only yeah. have let, let's let's well, let's make it not uh, hypothetical. If you only had Democrats that uh, that decided to do to to move to nonpartisan districting, and then every blue state did that, and every red state stuck with partisan districting, then what you'd end up having was an even less, uh, even more anti small d democratic, a less representative government you have now. Flip side on the if it went the other direction, but that's that's not right now the scenario that people are facing. Uh, you think there might be a chance on that. Any other element? And I recognize you're mostly focused on the voting rights stuff, but it is. I mean, they've got, you know, six months maybe before the midterms to try to push something through that would really impact the uh, really impact the uh, election structure. Is that the one you see hope for? Is there anything else on the on the weather vane list that is worth? Well, discussing? you know, on the on the campaign finance front, there's, you know, evidence of bills, you know, disclosure bills. Like I, I mentioned, you know, that the ones that seem to do poll well with Republicans that Democrats, because they've never had, you know, they haven't had control of the Senate in so long, have not had a chance to put on the floor just as standalone. So, you know, there's bills that like the Disclose Act that, you know, have if they've been put up on the House, they have gotten some Republican support. So I don't know if there'll be an appetite to start breaking things up. You know, I, I think the people behind us one are really against breaking it up. They kind of see it as like a coalition where you need everyone. But yeah. I do think, you know, I think on these bits and pieces, it's uh, there could be some interesting coalitions who come out for and against. But there's a reason why you don't see stuff push bits and pieces, because you kind of want those coalitions to have to yep. negotiate with each other to kind of get behind the big bill. Yep. Let's shift to Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, who was going to be a going to be a justice on the Supreme Court and now is the attorney general. And the president does have powers that are not. Uh, strictly defined by Congress. They are defined instead by the Constitution uh, the, and by previous legislation. There is now a Department of Justice. The president gets to appoint that person. Uh, and recent announcement for those people who are watching this stuff real time, recent announcement that the DOJ uh, and multiple friends of mine have worked for the Department of Justice, Voting Rights Division uh, and Civil Rights Division and the uh and say they're going to re and Merrick Garland now says he's going to reprioritize that stuff. What are some of the key steps that you're watching? So you you mentioned Merrick Garland, but I think it's worth noting a few other nominees or appointees that have made it to the Justice Department who have really strong credentials on voting rights. You have Vanita Gupta, who's the number three. Uh, you know, she's right there in, in leadership, and she previously led the Civil Rights Division under Obama. She was confirmed a couple weeks ago in this number three position. And she she's known for her criminal justice and police reform sort of efforts. But through the ex uh, felon voting issue has also got really steep knowledge on voting issues and was definitely involved in the 2020 efforts to make voting easier. So have her at the top of leadership really signals how important they view this. And then below her, you have Kristen Clark, who's leading the Civil Rights Division. She was just approved by the Senate a few weeks ago. And she started her legal career in the voting section as a career attorney. So she is also being looked to as someone who could really 
jumpstart that section. You know, for the last four years, it's kind of atrophied. The Trump administration wasn't particularly interested in bringing voting rights lawsuits. So she's someone everyone is expected to really sort of shake things up and get that section going again. And then with her, you have Pam Carlin. She did not need to go through Senate confirmation. So she's been there since basically the beginning of the administration. But another really smart voting rights attorney has been involved in big cases and has already done some kind of big things. She was the one who wrote the letter to the Arizona audit a couple weeks ago, flagging what they what she saw as potential federal election law violations. So I think you have there with the three of them, a team that's going to be very creative in their thinking, which and I think there's going to be a lot of expectation because there's been, you know, even before Trump, there was a sense in the voting rights community that the, the DOJ was not as aggressive as it could be, particularly after Shelby County, the Supreme Court decision in 2013 that gutted the Voting Rights Act. So I think it's going to be a lot of pressure. There's going to be a lot of hand wringing about, you know, are they doing enough? Are they doing too much? But I think it's going to be a really fascinating to watch. And I think we're going to just definitely see the pace pick up um, out of the DOJ Civil Rights Division. The... Uh... What are the steps, what are the levers that Civil Rights Division has uh, to address what individual states are doing on voter suppression, on harassment of election officials? That can, I can sort of, uh, that I can sort of guess. But yeah, what tools are in the toolbox for Vanita Gupta, et cetera? So the one, you know, the most obvious one is the Voting Rights Act. And it's been defamed quite a bit by the Supreme Court, you know, initially as it was passed in the 1960s, a certain states that had a history of racial discrimination in voting had to get their law, their changes to their procedures pre-approved by the DOJ, but the Supreme Court gutted that, that, that system. And so now that is not a tool they have anymore, but could have again if Congress passes that DRA bill that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but they still have other parts of the Voting Rights Act. They have Section 2, which lets the VRA as well as, or excuse me, as lets the DOJ as well as private parties proactively bring lawsuits. So, you know, we saw this at the end of the Obama era, lawsuits against North Carolina and Texas for restrictive laws. I would guess that at least some of the states um, that have passed restrictive laws or are about to pass restrictive laws will face some sort of threat of that. But there are other voting laws that get less attention. There's the NVRA, which could be used to address purges that are too aggressive. There's a there's a, the Help America Vote Act. There's UACAVA, which has to do with military voters. So there are a lot of laws on the books and a lot of questions of whether, you know, the laws that are on the books have been as aggressively as enforced as they could be. So it will be just, and that's why the news of Merrick Garland announcing last week that he's going to be, you know, doubling the staff in that division is, is notable because it's, what, what tools do we already have can we use that have just been just sat unused for the last couple of years because the, the division has been allowed to atrophy? Upcoming redistricting cycle is going to be the first one without the Voting Rights Act requirement uh, that certain states with a history of voter suppression and, and, uh, and racial segregation have to get their maps vetted by the federal government. Without that requirement, what is the role, what is an appropriate role for the DOJ on redistricting by states? So the DOJ can still use Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, the one I, I just mentioned, to bring redistricting lawsuits. We actually saw an example of this in Texas in the last decade. It's not the perfect example because, you know, obviously when Texas started drawing its maps in 2010, there was still preclearance. But, you know, the case evolved in a way that after that Supreme Court decision, uh, the DOJ relied on Section 2 again. That being said, those type of lawsuits are really new. They, you know, we haven't seen a ton of them from the DOJ. Some private parties have brought them, but they're they're really complicated. They require a lot of math, <laughs> so I'm not good at, at, at understanding them. And a lot of experts and a lot of analysis, you know, even kind of figuring out what jurisdictions are illegally diluting minority voters is is it's time consuming and resource consuming. And, and that's why the announcement of, you know, doubling the staff of the DOJ is important because that's gonna take, it's a lot harder to do back, do retroactively than when preclearance was in full effect. And these particular states had to prove to the DOJ that the way that they were drawing their maps was not discriminatory towards minor, minority voters. So I, I certainly think it's a question on the minds of Biden's leadership there. It's sort of new terrain for them to not have the preclearance tool 
to understand, you know, where voters' rights are in danger. So we'll see, you know, how that evolves and whether they they find that they can use that as an effective tool or if it's so cumbersome that they're sort of hamstring. It's it's definitely going to be something to watch. Shifting to Maricopa County and the audit in Arizona, sticking a little bit with Garland, he made his announcement and specifically called out the... uh, well, I guess I would put that in the form of a question. Do you, did he specifically call out the audit of the votes in Arizona's in Arizona's Maricopa County? He did. I mean, he did it in a way. He didn't say Arizona, but yeah. he referred to that letter that Pam Clark, the Biden appointee there, wrote as sort of an example of how these sketchy, amateur, partisan post-election audits run afoul of, or can run afoul of federal election law. You know, there are strict protocols for how audits are supposed to occur. There's, you know, this is stuff that election officials, and we saw a lot of reviews and verifications of an audits after the 2020 election, but they were done by election officials and experts who understand this. And what is happening now in Maricopa is you bring in these security, these cybersecurity firms who have no specific election expertise, and they're led by people who were promoting fraudulent theories. And, you, you know, they're not they're buffoonish, if not dangerous, for how they're sort of influ- fueling these sort of fraud beliefs and this expectation that they're going to uncover something that shows Trump won. So there are federal laws here in play that, as we saw in that letter and as Attorney General Garland mentioned in his speech, there are laws about keeping ballots secure, not intimidating voters that I think are going to be very much in play and very much something that the DOJ is going to be looking to as a way to uh, address this this audit trend that we're seeing. Arizona Republican State Senator Wendy Rogers threatened Garland with time in an Arizona prison if he interfered with the state's audit. Presumably that threat has no weight except for its rhetorical benefit with supporters of that uh, elected official. Uh, Anything you want to unpack there? I mean, I would I certainly agree with your uh, your uh, understanding there. And I, I will say, you know, I think if if it's between this senator, Merrick Garland, who has a better understanding of the law and their capabilities and what's illegal and what's not, uh, I think Merrick Garland probably has a better understanding of how that works. You know, I will note that, it again, it, it kind of goes to the politics of it all. And, you know, the attorney general in Arizona, his, this guy named Mark Barnovich, uh, I might have mispronounced that, he... Uh, he also responded to Attorney General Garland's speech in a letter this week that was, you know, I mean, he didn't threaten to throw Garland in jail, but it was similar in tone of just, you know, throwing flames and accusations. But there wasn't a lot in there that was sort of grounding the law and kind of pointing to legal precedents. And if you look at the DOJ letter that sort of kicked off this fight, there was. So... I think a lot of this, like you said, is rhetorical. A lot of this is about ginning up the base that attorney general in Arizona is running for the U.S. Senate. So there's some (laughs) political reasons he might want to just put himself on the front of that fight. But uh, I think uh, Merrick Garland doesn't have to worry about being thrown in jail. (laughs) He's the one who can put people in jail. Sorry. (laughs) Typos in Texas's uh, voting suppression bill. Last month, Texas House passed a restrictive voter suppression bill that included limiting early voting hours on Sunday after uh, 1 p.m. Instead of a vote in the Senate, Democratic lawmakers walked out, blocking the vote allowing that would have allowed that bill to be passed. Now, Texas Republicans are saying there are typos in the bill that need to be corrected, even though they argued in favor of those typos and the bill was being debated. What do I have right? What do I have wrong? What do people need to understand? Yeah, I think that the typo argument is hilarious. It was very clear if you watched the floor debate that, that was what was intended in that bill. But I, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the podcast, you know, a lot of this happens by design in the middle of the night very quickly that I think, you know, rank and file lawmakers don't even take that close a look at what they're voting for. They're just told, you know, vote for this bill. And they kind of, you know, take it for granted that voters won't look at it very closely either. But because the Democrats were in, effective and at least stalling this push by using a procedural mechanism of you know, denying Republicans a quorum, and now they have to come back for a special special session to pass it. It has shed light on a lot of these provisions, and turns out they're very unpopular. So you now have Republican lawmakers walking away from them and claiming it was a typo, or they had no idea it was in the bill. 
So I think it's a lot of just uh, blame shifting, a lot of it just distancing because now there's several weeks that people are going to be talking about these provisions as opposed to, you know, what was going to be just a quick couple day process of introducing the bill and getting it passed. And remind people what the typos were. What's at issue here? So there's two provisions in particular that you've sort of seen this distancing. One was a provision that would have uh, limited Sunday in-person early voting. So just a refresher on Texas, they have very strict mail-in voting rules. You have to, you know, you have to have a uh, fit a requirement, but they do have early voting and that's what they often point to as why it's okay. They don't have a lot of mail-in voting. The But what the legislature wanted to do with this bill is create a limit that Sunday voting in the early voting period could not start before 1 p.m. And it's pretty obvious that that was aimed at the souls to the polls drives that are popular, particularly among black voters. But really, there's no reason that anyone should be denied, you know, a Sunday morning voting period arbitrarily. And the, the you know, that was one of the examples where they claimed, oh, that was a typo. We didn't mean to limit it to 1 p.m. or after. The second provision that you were seeing this sort of backing away from was one that would have lowered the threshold by which a judge could intervene in an election and say, yeah, I'm, we're not going to certify this. We're going to we're going to challenge this. It, it would just make it easier. If we think back to, you know, what happened last year and early this year, the pressure Trump was putting on, you know, everyone he could to sort of not certify Biden's win. This is just another avenue where that pressure could have been applied. And uh, again, it was so sort of disturbing to see, I think, Republicans kind of had to back away from it once people started talking about it. Chris Neverhart, in a previous episode, she wrote the book, Becoming a Democracy, made the case that Texas was maybe the worst state when it comes to voting access. Do you want to stand up for Texas? Do you want to pile on? Uh, you have any uh, any general or specific feedback on Chris Neverhart's claim? <laughs> I think it's definitely a fair claim. I don't know. I would feel like I'd have to kind of go through the the list again, and things have certainly changed a lot in the last couple months with everyone sort of reshifting their it's roles. It's a vigorous but, race to be worst. But I will certainly say in the pandemic, when you saw, you know, even red states loosen their mail-in voting rules uh, because of COVID and just it being this probably, the, you know, one of the safer ways to vote, Texas resisted that in a way that I think was unmatched by any other state, just how aggressively they fought any sort of accommodation to help people vote by mail so that they wouldn't have to go in person and put their lives in danger. So I think I certainly would say that they are, you know, on, in a league of their own and how aggressively they fought mail and voting during the pandemic. They weren't the only state to resist it, but there was something really just just disturbingly aggressive and how how much they wanted to make that make sure that didn't happen. How come? And I might ask, is there anything in their strong resistance to voting voter access that sheds a light that we haven't already shed in this discussion? You know, I I have a hard time understanding it totally myself. I I wouldn't be surprised if it was at least in part. I mean, obviously, Texas has an extremely long history of uh resisting, you know, any move to make voting easier and has worked aggressively to make it harder. But I wouldn't be surprised if sort of Trump coming out against it was a big, uh, big flavor of it. You have to think that if, you know, in March or April of last year, Trump came out and said, you know what, in a pandemic, everyone should be able to vote by mail. You know, that's just that's just common sense. Everyone should do it. You have to think that people like Ken Paxton and Greg Abbott, these very Trump aligned figures would have just jumped right on board, but that's not what happened. And I think it just, you know, I think Texas would have always resisted it just in some regard, but certainly having Trump being so anti vote by mail helped fuel that resistance. Why should voting be easier? Maybe, <laughs> maybe people, if it's serious enough, maybe it should be hard. So only serious people do it who actually do it seriously. It shouldn't just be a throw away, easy thing to do. You can do with an easy click of a button or something. Uh, I would say when you call something a right, it means that you have a right to it. You have a right to engage in that. And it, it, do you really have a right if there's a bunch of hurdles that are putting being put up between you and that right? I think that would be my, you know, my my first response, and then we can go into the deeper questions of why democracy, where people can't let's participate do it easily. <laughs> let, let's let's do it a little bit. Like what you say, right? 
somebody else said, no, it's a responsibility. It's an opportunity. Um, it has not been a, a fundamental right identified in the in the Constitution by the Supreme Court at this point in the movie. And that although there's those of us who think that's a a mistake and basically a vestige of racial discrimination uh, uh, and, and a desire for oligarchy. Uh, the uh, but but play the game with me. Why isn't it just a responsibility, which gets back to why make it easier? Why is it actually good for a country to make it easier to vote? I would say philosophically, if you want to think about this in an abstract way. Sure. Democracy is a pact where it's I will not do, you know, I will follow the rules of the game as long as I have a say in shaping those rules. I will, you know, I will not, I mean, this is, I, we started the conversation on January 6th, so I'm noting the irony here, but just in the abstract, I will not launch a violent coup against my government because I don't like what they're, you know, I don't like who's in charge of it right now. The the pact is, as me as a citizen, will respect the rules, will we'll do, you know, play my role in society as long as I have a say in, in what those rules and those policies look like. But if I'm denied that say, you know, maybe not officially, but effectively because you've made it hard for me to vote, why would I play along with that pact? The democracy is stronger if more people do it. Yes. What if I'd rather, uh, what if I think my gun is stronger than my vote? And I would rather, uh, I would rather exercise power because I have learned how to use appropriately, aim appropriately, take care of and clean appropriately, store appropriately uh, a firearm, and I've managed to possess some of them. I don't think that's the way most people want to live uh, in society, but maybe I'm wrong. It, it's, I, I dwell on it because we, because uh, the case you make is that a vote is for power, all right, and that, uh, and that what will helps motivate people to think about it is not like how it will be good for the team or bad for the team they're rooting for, but how it gives them power. And that was the case you made before. And it's sort of the case you're making now also. This is mm -hmm. the way that I, I can bought into the society because I have some power in the society. There's those who think, oh, well, maybe it doesn't give me much power. What does give me power is other stuff. If I have, if I have money, if I have firearms, those things can make sure that I can buy stuff, protect myself, and if things get really, really bad, I can hurt someone who wants to either hurt me or hurt something I care about. And that's real power. All your voting stuff is liberal hooey. <laughs> Obviously, I am not, like, I am rooting for democracy. That is why this court sits. And I don't want to take those arguments, those presuppositions, those a priori's as merely unstated, because I don't think right now there is a sufficient consensus in the country around them. I think we have to rebuild that consensus. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. And I do think sort of kind of stepping out from the sort of nitty gritty of certain restrictions and certain proposals and certain rules and just stepping back and, and asking as you have this last hour, you know, why do we do this? Why do we talk about this is critical. And I think it's a way to reframe the debate from what it's been in, in Washington, which is, you know, one side saying, well, you're only doing this because it's going to make you more powerful. Why do you do this? Me? Yeah. <laughs> As a reporter? Yeah. Uh, it's been a fun beat to cover because, well, at least until this past year, I think it was undercovered quite a bit. Mm. So it was a fun place to be just as a reporter in terms of, the kind of reporting you could do it just felt like, you know, there, I don't want to, there were certainly several great voting rights reporters who've been doing this for years. So I'm not taking away from any of them, but you know, when it's not a busy reporting field, it's just from a reporter sort of work reward uh, standpoint, you, you know, it's just, you get a lot of bang for your buck, at least until last year when everyone else started paying attention to this stuff. And yeah, and I think it is, it's something, like you said, it's fundamental, you know, a lot of these issues get kind of, watered down to both sides and trade-offs. And I and I do think that that could be fun and interesting too. I actually spent a lot of time reporting on healthcare, which is very much a complicated uh, complicated trade-off. One side wins, one side lose, but no one's, you know, it's just kind of money and rules and how all of that works. But with voting, you could kind of break it down to a simple way, a simple philosophical way. It's like this thing that's, that's being done, is it going to make it easier for you to, vote are harder for you to vote. And certainly you could step back and ask these questions about, well, why do we care that it, that it's easier to vote? But I think, you know, at least at TPM, most people, you know, 
can kind of make the decision for themselves that they where they want voting to be and how they, accessible they want to be. And I can just communicate whether we're turning towards that direction or away from that direction. We've talked about state legislatures, we've talked about the Department of Justice or the executive branch. We've also talked about Congress, the legislative branch. We should close at least with a moment on the Supreme Court. Any cases, I know that you also cover uh, the Supreme Court. Are there any cases you're watching for that should be on people's radar screen or that are on your radar screen? Absolutely. There's actually a, a, a pretty important Voting Rights Act case uh, that will be decided in the coming weeks. It arose out of Arizona where, you know, a couple policies were challenged by Democrats actually for being too restrictive and allegedly uh, discriminating against voters of color. And it's been it's been sort of a it's a, been a, t- a tense case to cover because there's some people in the voting rights community who think that because the Supreme Court is so conservative and so unsympathetic to voting rights, that it was a, it was too much of a gamble for Democrats to be bringing this case in the first place. And it was going to give the Supreme Court another opportunity to limit the reach of the Voting Rights Act. So, you know, the essential question in this case is I described Section 2 and how it was going to be an important tool for the DOJ. This case could give the Supreme Court the opportunity to, to limit DO, the, the reach of that section even more and increase the, the burden for what the DOJ or private party would have to prove to get a court to say, yep, this law is discriminatory, we have to strike it down. So that's certainly what I'm watching and I think it'll be coming by the end of the month or early in July. Well, Tierney Sneed will be watching for it. Investigative reporter, contributor to the Franchise Voting Rights Weekly Newsletter. Tierney, where can we find out more? You can plug your stuff, or you might even tell us things that you're watching that we should watch also. Oh, I would just say sign up for the newsletter. And, you know, TPM has been so great about being in the front of center of voting rights from the very beginning of its, uh, from when it was launched in 2000. So I think it's you know, really been on the vanguard of covering these issues, and I've been proud to be here. So, you know, just would plug my organization. Tierney, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for what you do, and thanks for being a democracy nerd. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Be well.